Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. The text this week for Transfiguration of Our Lord, February 14th, 2021, uh, are 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. The psalm is 50, verses 1 through 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. And the gospel reading is Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. Happy and transfiguration to you all. Happy transfiguration. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day. Oh, happy Peeps. Valentine's Day. And Very exciting. One of my goddaughter's baptismal birthdays. See if I can remember to get a happy Valentine's suitably Day. religious gift off. I know I'll get a her. I'll get a Valentine's Day card from my dad. That will be uh, really special. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah It'll be very special. Anybody sending out Transfiguration Day cards? Anything like that? <laughs> I'm I'm actually planning on getting a Valentine's Day letter out. My my great my grandpa always did that uh, rather than a Christmas letter. He would get all of them and then he would wait a month and a half. But that's got nothing to do with transfiguration. Actually, um, not. <laughs> so let's bring it on. Um, I am going to begin by saying uh, I love this uh, a reminder in the commentary that every time we gather for worship in whatever format it is, it is an opportunity for us to see Jesus for who Jesus is. Uh, that, that's not exactly how she states it, but uh, it was a powerful uh, reminder um, uh, for me as I as I read the way that she stated that. Uh, I often look at this text and, and uh, kind of say, you know, that Jesus is is saying to, to Pete, Jimmy, and John, hey, come on, uh, I'll take you up on the mountain and we're going to just take a look at things. And um, uh, it, it's, it's, it becomes more than they could have thought and imagined. And that immediate response of the awe of the tying together of their past uh, the, the law and the prophets uh, of Elijah and Moses in the presence of the one that they are now following leads to this just a response of, okay, okay, yeah, 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 we, we should be here and I don't know, we should probably do something. And what does it mean to remember that sometimes the awe of being made aware of who Jesus is, is for us to simply take a moment and be in awe before we decide what the next task is. Sometimes the response is not to do, it's to be in the moment. Well, That's a good I, point. Oh, and, hey, go ahead. hey, 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 I'm just, uh, I'm trying to like be in the moment. <laughs> Give me a second. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rolf. Okay, now you may proceed. Very nice. Well, I think especially with regard to that, uh, Joy, is uh, I was thinking about this uh, passage this year in terms of just a, a kind of irony uh, when you think of what, when you recognize what comes immediately before this. Uh, of uh, of the transfiguration where you have the uh, where you have the first passion prediction yeah. and then taking up your cross yeah and then and and uh, and when when we have the transfiguration what is it that what what is it that Peter wants to hold on to uh, I was uh, uh, that it, and particularly when it when when Jesus talks about uh, preserving your life or saving your life. What is, what is it about his life or what is it about this life with Jesus that he wants to hold on to? I, I did a workshop with uh, preachers on this text a, 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 a couple weeks ago, and I titled this, um, this sermon, Life Preservers like the way in which uh, on, on, on Caesarea Philippi, but, but, but so there's such, I think that's part of what 
is important about this text though is the contrast between Caesarea Philippi and then mm. the transfiguration and what is it that Peter wants to hold on to but mm. at the same time we hold on to both because with the passion prediction I uh, you know we call it the passion prediction but at the same time it's a resurrection prediction yes and so it's it you know in the three days I will rise again but then we kind of forget about that part and so I uh, and and so that's that's in part what we're asked to hold on to in the transfiguration, particularly transferring to Lent, is this you know is this is this simultaneity of glory, uh, but what does glory look like? What is this glory going to look like? What is it that we're holding on to uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to Jesus' ministry? When it comes to who we want Jesus to be? So I, I think that you, what you're talking about could really get unpacked even further by putting that context of that of that juxtaposition of of the passion prediction Caesarea Philippi and then um, and who do you say that I am right um, and and uh, and uh, and I think too in verse 34 you know first it's with the disciples but then in verse 34 he called the crowd. So we can't escape that, you know, we're, we're, we, we, this is not just uh, us observing uh, what's going on, but we're asked, we're being asked to, uh, what is, what is our response going to be in this? And the holding on to is not just this moment that we are experiencing, but it is the story that promised Moses and Elijah, the, the, the scriptures, their ancient wisdom that promise that God would show up and disrupt all of the uh, brokenness in the world with healing, with salvation. I like that life preservers. I am, um, this passage, um, it's to get here after being in Mark one for what, three, four, five weeks, and then to jump here because of the liturgical year is just disorienting for me. Um, that I really don't like it uh, in terms of narrative. The, the flow, understanding that we've missed, as you said, Caroline, we've missed Caesarea Philippi and we've missed um, uh, Peter's confession and the first teaching, uh, the, the verb in Greek is to teach. He taught them that the son of man you know, must suffer and then be raised. Um, the esk, the, the Elijah's, Elijah and Moses are the eschatological figures. Uh, two of them expected. So we had a few weeks ago, the prophet like Moses that they expected. And of course, uh, Elijah is taken directly to heaven in the chariot of fire. And so then at the end, you know, Ma um, Malachi, I will send my prophet Elijah. And so this is an eschatological inbreaking, declaring who Jesus is, but then pointing ahead to where Jesus must go. I've said this before. Um, heard a great sermon on this by a colleague, Mark Thronfeit, uh, that uh, at either end of Lent, you get Jesus on a mountain. On one is the Jesus we want, and the other is the Jesus we get. You know, Jesus lit up like the Vegas Strip here, Jesus in the dark dead, right? You can just play that back and forth. And I think it really introduces Lent in a powerful way. There's such a confluence of, of different things going on, you know, in this and the, I think if I were preaching this this year, I'd be thinking about the ways in which the disciples experience is not ours. I mean, they are used to Jesus as, as a flesh and blood person among them. Uh, they're given a glimpse here of something totally different, right? Something utterly transcendent. We are people who come at the story never having known Jesus in the flesh um, as people who worship a risen Christ. And so it's just, you know what I mean? We're coming at this in different ways uh, and the shock is different. Or to go back to what you were saying, Joy, the way in which we sit in the moment is perhaps slightly different in terms of how are we, you know, how are we, how does this, how does this narrative, which stands at all these literary junctures as well, like you were talking about Caroline, also call us into imagining Jesus as more than what we assume him to be. Um, and is there a glimpse here of future glory? Is there a glimpse here of something more? And I don't know if you can explain this. I don't think I want pre a preacher to try to explain this to me, but to always be pulled into that, 
that idea of something bigger, of something more grand, that idea of something more luminous um, is worth doing, especially when I think about our traditions that tend to be more explained kinds of traditions than we are experiential, sit in the moment kinds of traditions when it comes to preaching at least or to, to catechesis. Okay. Anything else about, <laughs> good. No, any, anything else about, no, I think, I. but I, I'm thinking in terms of how that is to just kind of a, the way in which transfiguration functions as this bridge between Lent, uh, between Epiphany and Lent, and uh, how is it that how is it that transfiguration both is a a, a reflective time of of being in the moment, as Joy said, of a reflective time of looking back, but then also looking forward in terms of what is it what is it that we are going to see in Lent, uh, and then and uh, and that's why I find that, you know, the transfiguration of that juxtaposition of who do you say that I am and then and um, and the passion prediction and then the transfiguration. It's just like, whoa, how in, in the space of <laughs> very few verses, how are we getting our head around all of these things about Jesus at the same time? And there's something really there's something really important about that recognition uh, and that it's and then it's not about uh, it kind of. Uh, coming to an understanding, but how do we hold all of these things together? And uh, and and I think that's an, an important place to sit for a little bit uh, as we leave Epiphany behind and move into Lent. And maybe that's part of what the worship service does. This this you know, assuming we're still on Zoom, and um, maybe that's part of what the worship service does too, is allow for that space to uh, of of hindsight and foresight uh, that that this passage represents. Well, and especially to consider this too as a, as a connection to that notion of the time being fulfilled and uh, you know, the connection to the baptism, the connection of the idea of the preaching of the good news. And it's an invitation to help people think, okay, how is Lent an extension of this as opposed to something that happens to Jesus or that catches him by surprise or something like that. But it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a way to underscore, and I don't know if this is the right word, but I'd say the intentionality that runs through this gospel and through Jesus own ministry as well. So um, yeah, it, it's, how do you, how do you treat this text as the really weird unique thing that it is while at the same time saying it's not a massive collision with other themes that are taking place in the story of Jesus, his life, his ministry, his death and resurrection. I love, I love all that. I love, and I love the middle section of Mark, uh, really from Mark 8, um, 22 through chapter 10, um, where you get the three um, teachings about the passion and the resurrection, and you get Peter's confession and then the transfiguration. And then each time, uh, the right after the di disciples do something to show that they understand who Jesus is, but they don't understand. And that this whole section is then um, inclusioed, uh, bookended by the healings of the blind men. In chapter eight, it's the Jesus heals them. It's the only healing that's uh, that doesn't take that Jesus goofs up and he has to do a second surgery, you know, so that he heals me. He says, Can you see? Yeah, but everybody looks like an ant. They all look like walking trees and they, oh, let me try again. And which I think, and then at the end you get, uh, you know, blind Bartimaeus. I think that that's emblematic or symbolic of the fact that the disciples are starting to see, but they don't get it till after the resurrection. And we, his followers, both see and understand who Jesus is and we don't, and we're never going to get it right. And so there's a humility. In the past weeks, we've been talking about what does it mean to speak for God? confidently and prophetically. And one of the things is uh, humbly that to understand that we need each other, we need community, we're not, we never get it right perfectly. Or at least I don't. So the, the uh, connection to Second Kings is, uh, I'm trying to figure that out. Elijah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought maybe it was a fish. Is there a fish? Things that are bright as well. <laughs> this is, I mean, a great story and an important story. It shows up elsewhere in the lectionary. I'm, I, I'm not sure how it helps me on, on Transfiguration Day, but 
maybe I'm just not being creative enough. Um, let's just talk about it as a great story. Let's say that uh, let's say that you uh, um, your your job is not to preach the the, um, the liturgical day. That's not your job. Your job is to preach the text, Caroline, in light of the liturgical day. Is like uh, uh, or like as that, you yeah. say. And so you're going to preach uh, this story. Um, the, it is a great ahead. story. Well, and but I, but I do want to still hold on to a bit of the Transfiguration Day totally. and and say that part of what's going on here is Elisha is grieved in some way or wants to hold on to something that can't be permanent. Um, That's a connection. Perhaps. Yeah, but but it is partly, you know, that our glimpses of the transcendent are always brief. I'm just, I'm, I'm laughing. Sorry, I'm not laughing at what you're saying. I'm laughing at Elijah, Elisha, rather, Elisha. Um, Elisha, as we know from the story that comes shortly after, uh, is a bit, uh, he, he can get angry. He's, he's a crabby prophet. You know, he... Uh, when boys tease him, the bear comes out and eats the boys, you know, for because he's baldy. And uh, so, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from me? Uh, yes, I know. Shut up. Then he goes on and they say, hey, um, do you know that the Lord uh, is going to take your master? Yes, I know. Shut up. Right. But he, uh, part of that detail is, okay, it's telling us this isn't a story primarily about the meaning of the story is not that Elijah is taken into heaven directly, one of only two people in the Old Testament that's taken into heaven directly without dying. Um, that's not the point of the story because everybody knows it and they keep telling it to him. Really, the point of the story is the inheriting of the prophetic spirit. Mm -hmm. And how does God, and this ties back to, um, a prophet like Moses that we saw, and the inheriting of the prophetic spirit. I just, if you could inherit the prophetic spirit or the didactic spirit of any of your teachers, who would it be? Mm. And how would you pray for that? And how would you know that the mantle falls on you? Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that's, that's part of what's happening in the transfiguration too. Uh, I think there is, as soon as you started talking about that, Matt and Rolf, that this, uh, this, there, there is going to be a transfer of power, if you will. Uh, and that, and that sort of realization of the transfer of power from, uh, from Jesus to the disciples is, uh, is getting closer uh, at the end of chapter 10, you know, this, this, this middle section, as you said, Rolf, at the end of chapter 10, beginning of chapter 11 is the entry into Jerusalem. And so, uh, and, and so there is something about, um, part of the question to, uh, to Peter from, from Jesus about who do you say that I am is, be, is not just, you know, to get the right answer, but it's like, okay, well, how are you going to continue this on? Uh, what is that going to look like? Um, because I'm not going to, I'm not going to be here anymore. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, that's what the transfiguration is. You can't hold on to me. I'm not going to stay here. And so uh, how you answer that question doesn't just have to do with me. It has to do with how you, how are you going to, uh, how are you going to follow me and how are you going to pick up that mantle? So that could be a connection too with transfiguration if you wanted to go that direction. Yeah. By the way, they, you have to add verses again, my favorite thing to do, uh, because the, it stops, right? It, it ends, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And then he tears his own clothing. And then the next verse, he walks over and he picks up the mantle of Elijah. Mm -hmm. uh, Symbolic, he tears his own clothing. People didn't do that in the ancient world except under extreme duress because you probably only had one coat and everything you had had to be handmade. It wasn't just go buy another one. And part of the story is Elijah says, you know, he says, let me inherit a double share of your spirit. Um, inheritance laws, the oldest son got a double share of the estate. 
Elisha, um, among all of Elijah's followers, is asking for a double share, not of the estate, but of the spirit. I mean, just, just notice that. And Elijah says, that that's, not, that's, that's not for me um, to decide. That's God. God decides that. Uh, and here's how you'll know it, the mantle, you know, and he does inherit it because the mantle falls on him. Um, anyway, I love the story. Um, if somebody quick asks me to preach, that's what I'm preaching on, but probably not this year. <laughs> what about Psalm 51 to 6? Man, it's a great festival song. Song, it's that too, but Psalm. Um, Thank you for your commentary, Rolf. Uh, you're welcome. Um, I'm glad, uh, glad you uh, received that. Um, it's, it's, it's a psalm that is odd uh, because it's, it's probably meant for the festival of booths in the fall. So it's actually meant for a big festival day of the liturgical year, uh, but for one probably that um, is at a different time of the year. Here, obviously, right, uh, it's because of the devouring, the, the devouring fire. I mean, you know, uh, and so the it's perfection response. of beauty, God shines forth. Is that yeah? Yeah, it's, that so the, it's a response to the Elijah story, yeah. but also then uh, fits with uh, the um, transfiguration story. <laughs> I couldn't find the yeah. word, but you know. Yeah. I've said everything I have to say it in my commentary. So let's uh, let's uh, we can move on to the uh, Corinthians. Text. Very good. Good idea. Well, it connects to the Second Corinthian text as well in some ways, you know. And and this is a really complicated part and sometimes problematic part of Second Corinthians. But just to pull this out a little bit and and maybe to focus on this idea of the glory of Christ being the icon or the the image of God. And then to talk about shining in our hearts, light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So it mm -hmm. it gets into it, it gets into incarnation questions, and again, the idea of seeing Jesus as more than just some guy, right, or one more prophet, but um, and, and a chance to reflect on that a little bit with people to um, to get a sense of what does that say about God, what does that say about humanity. Well, I think verse six, uh, too, for it is the God who said, let, let light shine out of darkness, that part of, part of what we're seeing in the transfiguration is that, is that glory of God to create, uh, to create brilliance and light uh, in the midst of, in the midst of darkness, or when things seem um, incredibly dark and bleak, and that this is, that this is the nature of God. And so, um, so Jesus as the icon or the image of God is, is projecting sort of that characteristic of God or who God is that who is able then to, uh, to shine in the midst of uh, what seems um, the darkness might overcome it to you. We use a little uh, John phrase there. So it, I think that that could be a connection too, uh, with that it's not just for the sake of, not just for the sake of the brilliance, and not just for the sake of 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 uh, you know, the magnificence of that light, but that that the light really does have a function of of um, overcoming that darkness and um, tying back to creation, and so uh, and then that's one of the promises of God, what we see in Jesus. I like the connection to creation there to see that as a creative act or see the transfiguration as an ongoing act of, of God's creative impulse and also the way in which the idea of light shining out of darkness is is about security, at least as I read it in the creation story, is about creating a safe space for life to flourish and to tie all that back in as well. Again, especially as we are entering into Lent, which tends to not be uh, as sunny in uh, in the topics that we uh, that we discuss. Your favorite season of the church here after Advent, right? Lent. I'm kidding. I like it because uh, here in my hemisphere it gets brighter and warmer every single day. That's what Lent means, I believe. Light, right? the light shines. Of days. The light shines even more. Lent means spring, right? Uh, lengthening, I believe it means. Okay. 
and therefore got it. The yeah. um, I'm the drawing lengthens. You know, the connection that a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it was last week that we talked about, I think it was two weeks ago, that when Jesus restores Peter's mother-in-law, he restores the image of God within her. Um, and uh, then you, you, you get that here, that Jesus then himself is the perfect image of God, you know, picking up that language from Genesis 1. And I've always liked this verse, but I just wonder what you think it means today. We do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. Um, what do you think that means, you know, entering this season of the both church and calendar year? Well, I think maybe it's a good reminder going into Lent uh, that uh, the way in which, and, and I've talked about this for years, when I gave, I gave up giving up things for Lent a long time ago, uh, and 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 the way in which it, Lent has become rather individualized in terms of personal piety and uh, and sacrifice and such. And if people want to do that, that's fine. I just you know, the, uh, great. Uh, but but maybe that maybe that's a helpful reminder than going into Lent that that at the end of the day, the focus is not on you. The focus is on Jesus. Uh, the focus is on what is, um, what is God revealing about God's self in, to use your favorite word, Rolf, in this journey to the cross. Uh, and, um, and how different our Lenten experience might be uh, if, if we take our cue from, uh, from Mark and, and say, uh, uh, is uh, how is our has our perspective changed to see that that this is truly the revelation of the kingdom that we're that we're moving that we are moving into uh and and we let our eyes focus on that and not uh and not on ourselves <laughs>